Welcome to the day three of the World Coffee Conference. Uh, I am Deepti Murthy, your MC for the day, and it's a pleasure to see you all here. The topic for today is a masterclass in espresso. So we'll, we are here to know the workshop about to improve the way we can make our espresso. So I have my eminent speakers here who have come in all the way from the UK. Uh, Ms. Emma Haynes. Ms. Emma Haynes is the founder of Caffeine, a UK-based business that supports coffee companies from seed to cup. She's also the UK sales manager for Algrano, an online platform which gives producers, roasters, direct market access. Coffee has been a passion in Emma's life for as long as she can remember. For the last 15 years, she has focused on training, in particular speciality of coffee, and how to incorporate speciality elements into commercial environments. She works all over Europe, West Asia, and beyond, and is a resident trainer also at London School of Coffee. Ms. Emma, I really welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our second panelist is Mr. Jonathan Townsend. Uh, Mr. Jonathan is the director and founder of the Institute of Coffee a qualified specialty coffee trainer and a brand ambassador for De Lohni. With over a decade's worth of experience in coffee industry, Mr. Jonathan's expertise is in consulting and barista training have reached some of the most established specialty and commercial coffee shops, as well as catering, food to go, restaurant services in the UK and internationally. Driven by providing training of the highest quality, John, has, John creates a safe and encouraging learning environment for all his trainees, consequently improving industry standards and providing people with better coffee. I request you all to take over the session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Firstly, I'd, oh. I won't touch my mic, I'll try not to do that. Um, I'd like to welcome you and thank you all for joining us today. We are really excited to be here. It's been an incredible conference. And this is actually our second time in India. So we've been working um, with the coffee board, uh, delivering some barista skills training. Some of our students you will see today. <laughs> um, and we're really excited to be uh, back here. Okay, so we are gonna kick off today's session um, we won't bother with an intro, because you've just had those. Um, but I just wanted to point out, because uh, we ran a session yesterday as well on the rise of alternative milk. And one of the greatest things for John and I was that there were lots of questions and lots of interaction. Let me tell you now that we really welcome questions, okay? So um, we'll try and cover as many as we can during the session. But I've also added our Instagram um, accounts in case you want to add any other questions afterwards, okay? We try to be as uh, responsive on there as we can, um, but we won't be answering any till we've had our lunch, put it that way. <laughs> okay, so these are the topics that we're going to cover today. What I want to do before we really kick off is try and gauge a bit of an understanding about you. So what is your role within coffee? Are you in coffee? Are you consumers? Are you home brewers, cafe owners, baristas? Just so that we can get a bit of an idea about the depth that we can go into with topics and also whether there's other elements that we might need to bring in or we might want to add. So can we just get a bit of an idea from you? How many of you are home enthusiasts or home brewers? Great. Fantastic. One thing I have learned from my time in India is that guys, you home enthusiasts, have an amazing opportunity to win the uh, national championship. So keep going. I've never seen such incredible <laughs> home brewers. Okay, super. Is anybody here a cafe owner? Great stuff. Excellent. Does anybody here work within a cafe environment? Maybe as a barista, as a perfect manager, anything? Excellent, okay. Hmm, what have I not covered? Okay, everybody else, give me an idea. So what do you do? Ah. Oh, amazing, okay, perfect. 
Um, yeah, we were just saying earlier actually about the boom that there is at the moment in yeah. India for single serve. And in the UK, it's very similar at the moment. It's a big market for it. Yeah, compostable, aluminium, there's always that debate. <laughs> okay, excellent. And anybody else? Is there anyone that's doing anything kind of completely different that might, any roasters here? Great stuff. Okay, excellent. Right, I think we've more or less covered it, but of course, if you have any specific questions, feel free to ask. So, we're going to look at what is espresso. We're going to actually give you a tiny bit of history around espresso as well. Um, because again, culturally, coffee the world over is very, very different. And it's one of, I believe, one of the most truly beautiful things about coffee is that there's actually no right way to drink it. There's lots of different ways we can enjoy it. And for us as trainers, uh, you know, we get the opportunity to work with people all over the world. And it's really wonderful to understand culturally where those differences come from. So it won't come as a surprise that we're going to have a bit of a heavy focus on Europe, in particular Italy, for that slide, but we'll give you a bit of insight. And, and I'd also like to include as well, like you're guided by your own preference as well, so it's not for us to tell you what's right and wrong mm -hmm. in this session, it's for us to have a, a deeper understanding to improve upon things, but in our own way. Yeah, and I think the other key thing is that whether you are an espresso drinker or not, you will hopefully gain some valuable insight into those that are. So even if it isn't your personal preferred preference, but you're a cafe owner or a roaster, you need to be well aware of these trends and this huge kind of increase in espresso consumption globally. So we're going to dig a little bit into espresso equipment uh, and some extraction science. We're going to do a couple of tastings. We'll keep them brief, but we'll try and dig into as much depth on those as possible. Then we're gonna look a little bit at troubleshooting. We can't necessarily cover everything, every example, everything that could ever occur in a cafe environment or at home if you're making espresso there, but we'll cover the most kind of common issues. And we'll talk a little bit about cafe considerations. Both John and I have extensive experience within cafe environments. Um, mine not so much more recently because I've moved more to do uh, more in the value chain, but I'm, I've been in coffee a very long time yeah, and, and that's a lot of... Uh, I'm still very much well involved with it, so it's so great you're well that we've covered. got that combination. <laughs> okay, so any questions before we begin? No, nope, that's a very good start, excellent. <laughs> okay, so what is espresso? Oh, <laughs> what a controversial thing to Google. <laughs> it really depends who you are, who you work for, where in the world you are, as to what the definition of espresso actually is. This one, I have taken lead from the SCA, the Specialty Coffee Association, because as mentioned before, both John and I are SCA trainers, so we are ASTs and we both teach barista skills. So just to give you a bit of an idea, when we talk about espresso, predominantly within specialty coffee, we are talking or we are referencing a double shot, okay? Not a single, a double. So typically, if we are discussing espresso, if we're talking about dialing in the grinder, if we're talking about um, recipe development, we will always be working to a double uh, espresso size, okay? So that usually means that we will have somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 mils of liquid, of beverage weight, in the cup, okay, when we've made the drink. For that, we need to start with the right amount of coffee, okay, so that's what we call the dose. We'll go into that in a little bit of detail. But typically for it to be called, or to be considered certainly a specialty espresso, you would use somewhere around 16 to 20 grams of coffee, okay? Now, of course, that will vary. I've seen 14 gram doses, I've seen 21, 22, gram doses in Australia, it's really, po or it was always very popular to dose up, but that's very common in Europe, 16 to 20 grams as a dose. Well, it, um, usually, not always, but we'll usually, often, we will extract our espresso using around nine bars of pressure, okay? Now, again, that can vary, and we will go into that a little bit later on, but that's the most typical 
uh, pressure you'll uh, come across. And then most often our recipes will have an extraction time of somewhere between 20 to 30 seconds, okay? So to give you a bit more information on the definition, typically we say that the flow of espresso will appear to have the viscosity of warm honey. What a lovely descriptor. If that's not very specialty coffee, I don't know what is. Um, the result of the beverage is usually fairly thick, fairly viscous. Um, it will have usually a thick golden crema on top, which will vary slightly in color. And some of the factors that will cause a variation will, of course, be roast profile for the roasters here. Um, espresso should be prepared specifically for and immediately served to the customer. Okay, so the thing with espresso, and you're going to see this in action shortly when we do the first tasting, um, we have to make it to order. Espresso is not a drink we can make and we can leave, okay? If we have an old espresso, if we have an aged espresso, it will stale very quickly. And there's numerous reasons why, um, but we really want to ensure that speed of service order of service, our workflow, all of those things within a cafe environment leading to us preparing the espresso um, promptly and serving it immediately. Okay, this is not a filter coffee you can leave warm. This is something you have to serve straight away. Now, I'm just going to ask for a quick raise of hands and I'm only asking for this so I can gauge the level where we're at for everybody so everybody can access this information. When I'm talking about 35 mils and 16 to 20 grams dose, is there anybody, and do not feel obliged to say yes or no here, I just want to make sure we're at the right level, is anybody really unfamiliar with that? Okay, so dose um, and things like beverage weight, dose and yield and extraction time, you're a little bit unfamiliar with. Okay, so that, it's good, I'll, go, I'll dig into that now. So just to give you a rough idea, when we're making an espresso, much like if we're brewing a filter coffee or, or doing any form of brewing, we need a recipe, okay? So I want you to forget about coffee for a second and imagine, what if we were baking a cake? Would we just throw a load of ingredients in, chuck it in an oven and hope for the best? Like, no, we wouldn't. We'd have at least a rough idea of what our recipe is and should be. And then we'd work to that. Espresso is no different. Okay, so with espresso, in order to create a good uh, final beverage, we need a recipe. So we split that down into three stages, three steps, okay? So we refer to, firstly, our dose. And our dose means how much ground coffee we are using, okay? So is that 16 grams? Is that 18 grams? Is it 20 grams? We work out what that recipe is going to be, dependent on many different factors, but we need to establish what our dose is, okay? And we can do that just by using scales. So we can take the porta filter from the espresso machine, pop that on the scales, zero, and then we'll weigh the grind, weigh our dose, okay? So we know what we're using, and then we adjust from there. Then we talk about yield or beverage weight. And what we're talking about there is how much liquid, how much final beverage I have in the cup. Now we talk about it in milliliters because it's a liquid. However, little trick for you. If you're looking at a recipe on your espresso machine, you can use scales and weigh your shot, your, your yield, in grams. Because at the temperature that we extract espresso at, or should be hopefully extracting it at, we have a more or less one for one uh, switch between milliliters and grams. There's a slight adjustment, and the hotter it is, the, the more you need to adjust that. But roughly, it's the, the same, okay? So you, it means you can weigh the, the coffee in. You can also weigh the coffee out, okay? And this is, we'll make a little bit more in a second when I talk about ratios. And then we say uh, an extraction time. And what this means is how long our extraction took. And we start our extraction timer, if you like, the moment we press the button on the machine, okay? 
So that's when we will effectively start considering our shot time. Not when it starts dripping into the cup, no. It's the moment we press the button. A lot of modern machines, so take for example this Astoria over here, this actually has a shot timer on it. So you don't even need to worry about timing it. For some more manual machines or some older machines or some very traditional classic machines, they don't have an integrated shot timer. So you would just time it separately, okay? Yeah, as, as well, one of the words you'll probably hear a lot today is around consistency. So making sure that you're timing the shot at the same time each time is going to benefit you much more than seeing when those first drops of espresso come out because it's always going to be slightly different. So if you can, start your shot time as soon as you press the button. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or if you're lucky to use a machine like that, it will do it for you. W some of the things we've spoken about, of course, we'll dig into in a bit more detail as we progress through, but I just want to make sure that we're all at that, that base level. Okay, so a little bit of very Italian espresso history for you, okay? So in the late 1800s, we actually had... Everybody forgets about this guy, poor Angelo. He's, he's virtually written out of espresso history. But he patented the first ever espresso machine, okay? Now, if we looked at his original design now, we'd be like, yeah, it's not really an espresso machine as we know it. It's much more like a big filter coffee machine. It's like a big batch brewer. But he was the original designer of the first espresso machine, okay? It was very um, simple in its design, but of course very complex for the time. And he did create this patent. However, what he didn't do very well, bless him, he was a designer, he was an engineer, he was a creative mind. He didn't really know how to market it. He didn't really know how to get it out there. So he created this really cool, you know, he had this great idea and it worked. He tested it, he built the machines and they worked. But there was never a machine built that was named after him. You know, we didn't kind of get that out to a wider audience because at that point, he just didn't understand how to do it. So in the early 1900s, 1901 to be exact, we had Luigi Bezzera come onto the scene and he took Moriondo's original design and was like, Whoa, this is good, you know, this is really good. But he improved on it. So he started to create from the original boiler system that had been designed, he started to create a more efficient steam system and understand slightly that you can generate pressure um, from water um, turned into steam, essentially. So he started to realize that he could really improve on the initial patent by um, understanding more about steam pressure. He also introduced the first porter filter. So that's what we refer to as... Um, essentially the handle that we put the coffee into that goes into the group head. If anybody's not sure at any point, stick your hand up and I'll show you it. Um, then, in 1903, we had Pavoni come onto the scene and he saw what Bezerra had done and he was like, well, <laughs> this is great, but this could be even better. So he actually did the design, this original Pavoni machine, which I actually think is a beautiful piece of art here in the top right corner. And he understood that he was using steam and a boiler, and he was generating steam from um, hot water, and realized that actually, this could be quite dangerous if we don't consider, you know, having hot water at a rolling boil under pressure in a big machine could be very dangerous. So he actually created the first pressure release valve. Is anybody familiar with a pressure release valve on an espresso machine? Some nods? Yeah, good, good. So essentially, um, it's a safety feature. If there is too much steam pressure created or generated inside the boiler, it will release. Um, and it basically stops an, an explosion from the boiler. So N not to scare anyone. You yeah, know, don't worry. Like, don't worry. These are very modern. These machines uh, are old. <laughs> very safe. But this was a really amazing feature because all of a sudden, it meant that this could go out to a wider audience. We can market this a bit more. So they actually exhibited it at the Milano Fair, and they worked together for a while. Um, so this was quite um, interesting how Bezerra and Pavoni both kind of, you know, joint minds. 
They marketed it better and it started to get a bigger outreach. And in 1905, has anybody heard of the Victoria Arduino brand? Yeah, pretty famous. If you've watched any World Barista Championships, if you've seen kind of anything going on in the specialty coffee scene around the world, they are very, um, very famous machines. And they also create a really great grinder that is you know, just exploded with um, the rise of specialty, the Mythos Grinder. They're, they're part of the Simonelli group as well, Nova so you, Simonelli. Might be, you might be more familiar with that. Yeah. So, in other words, they are still in existence today and they're a very big company uh, creating some very fancy machines. What Victoria Arduino did was they said, well, this is great, we're going to make our own version and we're going to market it. So up ramp the marketing. So this happened like quite quick succession, right, this development, this R&D. And all of a sudden, Vittorio Arduino were like, well, why do we want to move away from filter coffee and move to espresso? Well, it's quick. It's quick. We can grab it on the go. We're busy. We're Italian. We've got work to do. I mean, actually, if you go to most espresso bars now, everyone's kind of standing around enjoying that coffee. But um, this was marketed as like a quick drink. Don't hang around and wait for a filter coffee. Get an espresso. It's so quick. And I'm sure this, why, uh, this is why we now still hear people referring to it as espresso. It's express, but no. It's definitely espresso. They did a really grand job marketing it. So after Victoria Arduino kind of entered the scene, that was it. They started manufacturing in a much greater um, volume and selling, still predominantly focused on Italy because it was local market, um, but it started to really grow. And it was coming outside of, um, you know, a broader part of Italy and then slowly uh, working its way into Europe. Then in 1920, uh, Gaggia created the lever machine. Has anybody seen a lever machine in action? Excellent. They are beautiful. And let me tell you, all of the automation we have nowadays is pretty much always just trying to chase the perfect lever machine extraction. So you'll see lots of technology integrated into modern machines that is trying to replicate the beauty of a lever uh, profile, which we cover on the next slide. Um, but automated essentially. It's, it's quite interesting that a lot of things in coffee almost go a bit full circle. Full so circle. Where, where it began, we kind of gone back to where, where the origins of espresso were and are now deciding actually a lot of that was correct. Yeah. But for years, people were trying to dispel it to create something new. So it's super interesting how, you know, new isn't always best. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We see it in processing all the time, right? But that's a whole other story. So what happened with the lever machine? Prior to this, it was just a boiler that generated steam, and that would create this espresso. This, it would force some water through a bed of coffee, and you would get a, a concentrated liquid. But it wasn't very controlled. It wasn't very accurate. What the le and it also wasn't a lot of pressure. The lever machine was essentially a way of taking the steam pressure created and concentrating it and using a spring lever um, and essentially being able to then control the build-up and, importantly, the release of that pressure. So this meant that all of a sudden we could generate a lot more pressure. And if we generate more pressure, we force the water through the bed of coffee much with much more force, okay, which means we can extract more. It's also much more consistent. So the kind of integration of this lever into an espresso machine was just incredible and probably still today remains to be one of the greatest things that's ever happened in espresso other than, of course, the original design. Um, so once we had this nine bars of pressure, espresso just took off. We had this machine, we could create it, we can do this, it's consistent, it's safe, we have a pressure release valve. Um, and, you know, this is really great. And suddenly it just started to explode and it really uh, spread out across Europe, okay? And then, look at the jump. So we go, you know, fairly close together, pretty quick. Mm, then we go from 1905 to essentially the mid-20s with Gaggia, and then nothing really happened. We had loads of lever machines, and they were very beautiful, and some were shinier than others, and whatever. But that was really it. There wasn't much kind of happening uh, from a development side until FAEMA. 
in the 60s. So in 1961, Ernesto Valente, who worked for FEMA, created the first motorized pump. So he was like, yeah, Gaggia, I see your lever, it's great, but I'm gonna actually make this automatic. So he created this motorized pump that we still use in espresso machines around the world today, which basically means you press a button on the machine and click, on comes the pump and it does it for you. So this is why we don't have levers on our machines anymore. And, it, and it's a lot safer, that's for one. So a lot of what happened with the lever machines is that it had all that built-up pressure, it. it hits up, hits you in the face, potentially. So pressing yeah. the button, much easier, much safer. And much more consistent, right? Because yeah. we were automating it a bit more. And you know, we often know if we're gonna put something out at scale, if we automate it, consistency usually remains uh, you know, much higher. What we, yeah, I mean, it's a good point with a lever machine, by the way. If you ever get the opportunity to use one, please ask, please may I pull a shot on this lever machine, but watch yourself. <laughs> because the buildup of pressure in this lever as we pull it down, it's spring-loaded, and it will recoil, and if you have your face in the way, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> and I say that having learned it the hard way the first time I used one. Okay, so I just wanna give you a bit of a, an overview of kind of what that looked like, okay? So what I want you to think about, the difference between a lever and a pump, is that when we turn on a pump in a traditional sense in an espresso machine, so the, the 60s invention from uh, Ernesto, it was on or off. Now, of course, there's a slight graduation to a point, if we were to be super pedantic about it, but it's pretty much, you know, that, leave, um, that pump is on and it's, it's producing water or it's off. With a lever machine, it doesn't work like that. You have a gradual build-up, okay? So what happens with a lever machine is actually it's a really beautiful way to extract espresso because it does this pre-wetting. It allows the coffee to bloom. You may have heard about this with uh, filter coffee if you're doing a V60 or similar. So that means we are degassing the coffee and it removes any um, CO2 from the coffee bed and it means our shot can be more consistent. So actually, we were doing it kind of better with a lever machine because they're hard, they're hard work. You build up big muscles using a lever machine and it's a slow build up. With the pump, it's very much like straight up, on, off. So what we now see in modern espresso machines is actually a replication of the original lever machine. So there's a company called La Mazzocco and they created a machine called the Strada. I mean, there's also been the Strada 2 and maybe three now, uh, but they created a, a coffee machine called Estrada, very modern, very, um, and what that did was it enabled you to control the motorized pump to essentially replicate a lever, but at the touch of a button, really clever stuff. Conti, that are based in Monaco, they did the same, they created a modern lever machine, and we often have, even in very basic espresso machines now, we have, because the technology has become cheaper as it's become older, and of course there's a wider market for it now, we also still have things like a pre-infusion or a soft infusion. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah, like the baristas in the room are going to be like, yeah, this is techie, I know this. Um, if you haven't, don't worry. But it basically does what I was saying about with filter coffee. It enables you to pre-wet the coffee grounds, which gets rid of that CO2 and gives you a consistent bed for extraction. So ultimately, you can actually end up extracting more and more consistently um, because you don't have any gas in the way. In yeah, it, essentially, yeah, you saturate the bed in the pre-infusion and because of that wetting, it allows the water from the pressure to pass through it faster on the second pump up. So you can essentially extract more with a pre-infusion and it helps with that consistency as well, especially with what we'll be talking about, a lot of like uneven distribution. Mm -hmm. So it can aid with that. It's really, it's, to be honest, on the machines that can do it, it's a lifesaver. Yeah, it's very good. I know that's dramatic. Yeah, it, do, it won't save your life, but it will save your coffee, put it that way. <laughs> okay, so just talking about the different machines that we can purchase. I know it says at the bottom of this presentation, but the first thing to consider really is your budget because there's no good us talking about 20, 30,000 pound coffee machines and you not being able to purchase them because you're, you're not going to be able to use that technology that they have, which was more around like flow pressure and uh, pressure profiling, 
which are an incredible uh, resource in the industry, but very unlikely that you're going to come across them in a lot of specialty cafes because of the cost. So really, we're dealing with mostly what would be known as like single boiler machines and dual boiler and multi-boiler machines. So a single boiler machine is essentially works as a heat exchanger. So imagine a kettle. The kettle, it boils. What comes out of a kettle? Anyone? Thank you. <laughs> so you have the water that goes through to the groups, and you have a bit of cold water that brings the temperature down, and the steam goes out to the steam ones. It's as simple as that. And to adjust your temperature on those, all you do is you either increase the temperature and the pressure goes, sorry, increase the steam pressure, and the temperature goes up, and decrease the steam pressure, temperature down. So that's the only way that you can actually change the temperature of the group heads on those machines. Whereas, when you go into using uh, dual boilers or multi-boiler machines, they have separate dedicated steam boilers. So, you can then have the water from one boiler go to the group head, while the steam boiler works separately, giving you more control over that temperature. And when you get even more, you get the multi-boiler, so you can actually get each of the group heads. So, when I say group heads, it's one for each of the handles that you can see on the machines here. So you can have groups of a uh, one group machine, one handle, three group machine, three handles. So with the multi-boiler, you can change the temperature on each separate group, which is really uh, I don't, necessary if you've got a lot of different coffees that you're serving. So if you're serving three different coffees, they're going to need three different profiles, which might need three different temperatures. So the multi-boiler machine comes in handy if you are using more than one or two coffees. Now, the different features as well, this we briefly spoke about was pre-infusion. So there are two different pre-infusions. You have one which is more of a soft infusion, which is coming in at three bars of pressure, and a hard pre-infusion, which comes in at nine bars of pressure. If you can, opt for the soft infusion, because that's going to make more of a difference to your puck, whereas the hard infusion is just it's more likely to erode the coffee bed a lot faster. In terms of dialing in, a lot of the machines that you can buy will actually have scales on the drip trays rather than you having to pick a scale up from the grinder and move it over to the machine. So that's going to help in terms of workflow, so it's going to be a lot faster. But if you don't have that, of course, you have the scale to move between the sections as well. Other features, um, what I would look to are ones that you can change the um, steam pressure. So if you're, looking, if you're working in a fast-paced environment and you're making four or 500 coffees a day, your steam boiler needs to be working efficiently. Now, if you work somewhere and you're making all these shots, you're going to see your steam pressure start to drop. So we'd always suggest purchasing maybe those dual boilers if you're working in a fast-paced environment, or buying two heat exchange machines. There are some um, standalone uh, steam ones that you can buy for your bar, but they're far and few between. And I, I talk about this so much, and I always think it's kind of, it's the boring part of coffee, but it's the necessary part, and it's cleanliness is key. I cannot tell you the amount of cafes, restaurants, hotels that I go to, and they tell me, my coffee's tasting bad, and we open up the machine, and I go, there you go. Cleaning, honestly, clean the machine as much as possible. It's going to help the flavors of your coffee come through, rather than tasting the flavor of the coffee that was there from a month ago, two months <laughs> ago. You know, it's... Uh, it always amazes me when we get asked that question, and, it all, and a lot of the time, cleaning the machine is the answer. I won't bore you with how to clean the machine, but if you want to at the end, please come up and ask. I'm clearly quite <laughs> passionate about it. Uh, yeah. Now, moving on to your grinder. So we talk about something in coffee called like diminishing returns. So everything that comes before the coffee machine is more important because if the, if the machine you're using before isn't doing its job very well, it's not going to suddenly raise the quality for you. 
If anything, you're always starting here and it's going slowly down. So I always recommend, if you can, to spend more money on your grinder because that's gonna have more impact on the actual flavor of your coffee using a less expensive machine. Grind size, yeah, again, is another thing that is super key with this. Burr quality, huge. So if you've been using your grinder for, I don't know, a year or two years and you've never taken it apart and cleaned it and checked the actual sharpness of your burrs, uh, a good example I always use is if you have a blender um, and you're in a cafe and when you first get that blender, you're like, I love this, I can make smoothies, milkshakes really fast. A year later, you're like, eh, for about two, three minutes, it's, it's painful. That's because it's starting to wear down and the burrs have like lost their sharpness. So there is a point where grinders, the sharpness, once it's gone, there's no real saving it. You actually have to replace them and buy new ones. But yet again, by cleaning them, maintaining them, they're gonna last for longer. And there are different types of materials for burrs that you can buy that can prolong the burr life. So typically you have like steel burrs, but you can get titanium as well. They're more like or red titanium, longer lasting. Dialing in. So when you're every morning that you come in or whenever you start your shift, you need to get to your grinder and you need to check the setting that's on it. You can probably tell actually, as we did when we came in this room, it was quite warm out there. We came in and it was a little bit chillier. Now, temperature of the actual room has a huge impact on the grinder because if the burrs aren't very warm, they're not going to grind as fast. So the grind in the morning will change as you go through the day. So it's very important that how you left it in the evening will be different to how you get there in the morning. So make sure to double check. Just a very quick note on that as well. You'll see a lot with um, grinders in the marketplace now that they understand the um, issue with burrs and the adjusting temperature, especially you know certain parts of the world where there's big temperature fluctuations. Um, the other thing that will affect it is humidity. So what we're seeing in uh, a lot of grinders now, and again, as the technology becomes older, it becomes cheaper. And so we're seeing it in more and more grinders, is actually a temperature stabilization of the burrs. So you'll have grinders, I believe, I hope I'm not wrong saying this, but I believe it was the Victoria Arduino Mythos grinder that was the first to do it, but they actually heated the burrs. So not so hot that we're gonna actually damage the coffee, but they warmed them. So that you'd have to turn your grinder on in the morning and without even pulling a shot, you just wanted to leave the Mythos on and it would warm the burrs, okay? To give you this temperature stability because actually temperature can make a massive difference to the way your coffee grinds. So you can extract a shot that you've not adjusted anything and what's happened is the external temperature has changed and all of a sudden it's really erratic or it's extracting much quicker than it was or much, you know it will vary so yeah you can see that in the grinder technology as well now sorry just sorry. Um, <laughs> and when I say that does everyone or does anyone here know the term retention so if you just get a okay cool we can talk about that so a lot of the grinders that you have after you've ground coffee, there's always some left over in between the burrs and also the chute, the grinder chute as well. So you're aiming to buy a grinder that has the least amount of retention so that every time you dial in the next shot, you don't have to waste a lot of coffee and you're more likely to be getting fresh coffee going into your next shot. So it's very important to pay attention to that. It's not, you know, Super important. It's hard to say because when I go more for like the professional side, I think retention is super important, but it's something to keep an eye on and look at. And you can check retention by taking the grinder apart after you've made a shot and just weighing out the excess that's left in there. And just a, a little note on dialing in as well. So when we talk about dialing in, it's kind of a term we use. Again, it's something like maybe barista to barista, you'll talk about dialing in. But what we're referring to is checking 
your grind size and adjusting your grinder accordingly, okay? So just to give you a, a quick bit of insight into it, we're gonna cover it a bit more, but basically, if your extraction time is not really where you want it to be, if that recipe isn't quite where you want it to be, one of the um, simplest or most common ways to adjust that and correct it will be to adjust your grinder. So when we talk about dialing in, we're saying check this, check it in the morning, check it if it gets really busy in the middle of the day, check it again in the afternoon, um, and actually what you typically find is the more specialty the coffee shop or you know the more expensive the coffee the higher quality the coffee um, the more they will dial in the more they will check the calibration of their grinder so it's really but it doesn't essentially matter what coffee you're using you can really improve the quality of your espresso by checking that grind size constantly with your espresso machine as well a lot of modern machines have a, a, the ability to preset the the amount of water you use for a shot. It's only good if you set it up. So don't just rely on the button that gives you a certain amount of water. You know, when we're dialing in, that might not be correct. You need to actually set up your grinder and you also then need to set up your machine. Of course, if you're using the same coffee day in, day out, the changes will be minimal. But the way, the quickest, easiest, cheapest way to improve your espresso is by checking the calibration and it will change like that. Yeah, it's a, I always think quality scales. So if you're buying very expensive coffee, you're then gonna need the equipment to back it up. So it's kind of, it's a, you know, if you're gonna spend a lot of money on your coffee, then you need to really consider the grinder that you're putting that coffee through because that's ultimately gonna change the taste and sensory experience you're gonna have from it. Now we have two different grinder types. Are you, is everyone here familiar with both of these? Yeah. Does anyone here have a preference for our flat burrs for espresso? New hands, and anyone <laughs> for conical? Okay, love it. All right, so there is a split, which is great. So, yeah, again, they, they both have their pros and cons. With flat burr grinders, you tend to have a little bit, uh, they're a little bit slower, sorry. So, oh, sorry, the conical burrs are much faster. But yet again, this depends on the actual size of them because if you've got much bigger flat burrs, they will grind faster. But if the flat burrs are smaller, they're going to grind slower. So it's not always necessary that the conical will be a much faster grinder for you, but in most cases, it is. And with flat burrs, you tend to get more of a unimodal particle like distribution. So you normally get one peak that comes from it. That tends to be better for espresso. Yet again, if you're trying to extract more from it, if you're trying to get high extractions, flat burrs typically will be the best, as long as the quality's there for them. Whereas with a conical burr, you get this bimodal. So that means you end up with two different peaks. That can also benefit you with your espresso, just depending on what you're trying to extract from it as well. It's, a, it's difficult to summarize it in, uh, in a short space, but I would never say, okay, you, it has to be a flat burr for you to get the best out of your espresso, and it has to be a conical. It's a yet again about like, how you're maintaining it, you're cleaning it, and also, <laughs> what does it taste like? Ultimately, that's Not what it grinder, gets to. the grinder. Yeah, yeah, sorry, don't, don't taste the grinder, taste the <laughs> coffee. What we do see, interestingly, with these grinder burr types is a split um, globally. So in Europe, um, we love a flat burr. Most espresso, um, you know, most cafes serving espresso-based drinks, especially in, again, in specialty coffee shops, flat burr. And then typically, if you go to somewhere like Australia, they love conical burrs. So we have a lot of Australian baristas that work in the UK, and they're like, guys, like, what is going on with these grinders? Because they just can't get their head around the fact that we're using flat burrs, and they're used to this speed of service with conical. But the difference is, you can go into a coffee shop in London, and maybe there'll be two or three people waiting for espresso, and you might serve, you know, a few hundred um, espressos that day, maybe a bit more if you're lucky and you're very busy. In Melbourne, you can be serving literally into the thousands shot-wise. You know, in Sydney, the cafes are wildly busy by comparison. So the speed is 
critical. And I think what's been very clever when you look at the marketing in those regions is that the grinder manufacturers, they know this stuff and they've marketed accordingly. So I think it's really interesting. Again, exactly like John said, there's no right, there's no wrong. Do you want to do this first? Uh, sorry, John's going to go and disappear because we're doing some tastings now. Um, there's no right or wrong. Um, it's just choose the right grinder set for you or the right burst set for you. And again, one thing I would really try and drive home, and all the espresso machine manufacturers will want to strangle me for saying this, but if you are on a budget, and I think most of us are, whatever that budget looks like, we have to consider what we can spend on it. Spend the money on your grinder. Because if you do not have a good grinder, good burrs, consistent burrs, it doesn't matter how good your espresso machine. You could spend a wild amount of money on your espresso machine. If you don't have a, an adequate grinder, it's pointless. You won't be able to utilize any of the features of the espresso machine if you have a poor grind size. So when, you know, if I do any cafe consultancy and I'm working with a client and they say to me, you know, I've got this much to spend, but I need to get grinder and espresso machine, I'm like, Let's get you a dual boiler, but don't worry about any of the other features because we can manually implement a lot of that through good training and good service and workflow. Spend the money on the grinder. You know, that is where you'll really make a difference. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're moving into tastings, but as you can see for yourselves, there's a lot of you. And we have two machines, two baristas. So we're going to move as quickly as we can. Uh, but please have a little bit of patience while these shots come round. Um, what we are going to taste is two extremes of extraction, okay? So you have to, again, we're working in a workshop environment at the World Coffee Conference, so we're working to what we, what we can. The, the other um, kind of variables are different as well. We're using two different machines. They are the same grinder, but of course, we're not pulling the shots on the same grinder, so there'll be variation in uh, burr use and things. Um, but we have made everything as consistent as possible. Uh, the difference is, so it's the same coffee, both grinders. The difference will be the extraction, okay? So it is the grind size. So what we're looking at is whether you can identify a difference between the two. Now, before we do this, or as we do this, it's really critical for me to point out that there is no right or wrong with this. If you taste this and you don't notice a difference to, you know, from one to the other, don't worry about it. It's just a fun exercise for us to be able to show you, you know, in practice what we're referring to. One thing I will say is that if you are really interested in improving the quality of your espresso, taste it, taste it, taste it, taste it. I teach sensory, I do a lot of sensory, I cup a lot of coffees, lots of different types of coffee, processes, variety, origin, you name it, species. But espresso tasting is actually really tough. It's really intense. It's very concentrate. And I think for a lot of people, when they first start making espresso, or even if they've been making it a long time, if I put a row of shots on the table for a barista, they're like, oh. you know, it's hard work. It's really tough to, to taste a lot of espresso. So to improve your espresso, you, you need to push through that. You need to train yourself to be able to taste it, okay? There are other things we can look at with our espresso shots, which will give us a bit of an idea around quality. And that will be things like crema. There's a lot of information you can take about an espresso from the crema. Is the crema looking rich, golden? Do you have what we refer to as tiger striping? Um, you know, does it look uh, like you have a nice density of crema on top of the espresso? This is all good indications, right? If you have a thin crema, if you have a broken crema, if you have a crema that is, uh, you know, not looking very nice in color, not this rich golden color, then it could be an indicator that that espresso is not going to quite have the quality that you are hoping for. So actually, visually, we get a lot of um, indications as well. When we're pulling our shots, we get an idea about the quality. So for those of you that are maybe working as baristas or are really familiar with pulling shots, then you'll know, like most of us do, once you've pulled 100 espressos in your life, you really become familiar with it. And you'll know, like as soon as that shot starts, 
I know if it's going to be a good one or not. I'm like, boom, ah, oh, man, don't bother. So, like, if you pull an espresso and you get to eight seconds and nothing's happening, 10, nothing, 12, nothing, well, I was aiming for a 30-second shot, and I want maybe, I don't know, 38 mils, or let's say 40 mils of beverage weight, because I'm using a 20-gram dose, um, and nothing's in the cup after 15 seconds, it's not happening. So don't stand there waiting for 40, for 50, for 60 seconds while your poor machine struggles. Just kill the shot, move on to the next one, you know, calibrate the grinder. So what I'm talking about there with this like 20 to 40 and talking about the time, of course I'm using the, the recipe. I'm thinking and talking about the recipe. So one thing we have to consider with recipes is ratio. So by definition, an espresso, I mean, I gave you the kind of official definition, but when we talk about the ratio of espresso, we talk about a one to two ratio, okay? So we have one part coffee to two parts beverage weight, to two parts water. So essentially, that's really simple, really simple recipe to create, as long as I'm weighing, as long as I introduce scales or a way of measuring my dry coffee and my beverage weight, okay? If I, so to give you an example, we'll stick with 20 grams because it's a nice, easy round number that hopefully we can all follow and I won't forget. So let's say we're working with a 20 gram dose. I could do 20 grams of coffee in. If I pull uh, 20 grams or 20 mils of beverage weight, in say 28 seconds, I have not made an espresso. I've made a ristretto, okay? So ristretto as in restricted, as in a short shot. There was a time way back when, and I am old enough to remember it very well, sadly. There was a time when ristretto was hailed as um, a great shot to have. We should use it in flat whites because it's intense. No, no. In most espressos nowadays, if you pull a ristretto shot, you don't get everything you want in that coffee, okay? You'll get the early parts of the extraction, and we'll cover this in a minute. You'll get the early part. You'll get the organic acids, but you're not going to get the balance. You're not going to get all of those aromatics. You're not going to get the body. You're not going to have a balanced espresso. You've got a ristretto, which is a short shot, and it doesn't taste anywhere as close to what a balanced espresso would, okay? If we went uh, to a one to two ratio, so we say 20 grams dose in, 40 grams dose out, or 40 mil yield, um, and we're going to do that in, say, I don't know, somewhere between like 25 to 30 seconds, that's a more typical espresso, okay? So that's working on a one to two ratio. And then if we move, I would anticipate that to be pretty balanced, good body, good mouthfeel. Um, a good uh, overall kind of holistic extraction with all of those compounds in that, in that uh, beverage. And we'll talk about the compounds in a minute. If I do a 20 gram dose and I do maybe a one to three ratio, so I go for 60 uh, mil or 60 grams, so I've gone the opposite way, one part coffee to three parts water, I don't have an espresso. I have a lungo. And a lungo is a long shot. Has anybody ever tried a lungo? Sorry to hear that. <laughs> Some people will market a lungo as being like this great, there's a very famous company that may have initially started the single serve espresso capsule craze globally, um, and they have a lungo option. And this is for a longer shot option, but if you honestly, from a sensory perspective, compare a lungo to an espresso, they are miles apart. The body of a lungo is typically very thin, it's very watery, um, the coffee bed was exhausted, it can't give us any more. So now what we're pulling out is kind of um, wishy-washy liquid, wishy-washy water that we're putting into what was a balanced espresso. So with a lungo, typically, we find that the, the quality, uh, the sensory perspective is, is too far gone. Now... Sorry, uh, one second. Uh, please don't drink the, uh, the espressos just yet. Yeah. Thank you. These are, you'll get a cup one and a cup two. <laughs> and uh, I just want you to pop them on the table. You can smell them. 
you can visually assess them and you will drink them in a moment. Uh, but we just try and get everybody to have, uh, and then we'll go through it together. So when we talk about these ratios, I am not saying you should only ever pour a 20 gram, you know, 20 gram dose and a 40 gram yield. Absolutely not. The beauty of coffee is that every coffee you brew will be different, depending on the age, the roast profile, the origin, the process and many other factors. So the key to a great espresso is understanding this and then playing around with it. So actually, maybe I don't want a one to two. Maybe I want a one to 1.85 ratio. Maybe I want a one to 2.15 ratio, whatever. Um, but we roughly, the place to start will be creating a recipe that works roughly to our one to two ratio. And if you speak to World Barista Champions, if you speak to anybody that you know pulls espresso um, in specialty coffee shops around the globe, typically you will find they are working roughly to a one to two ratio. They'll have their own variation on it, but it will be roughly sitting around that point, or they would have at least started with that. Yeah? Sorry, let me get you a mic. Do we have a microphone? Sorry. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay. So, yeah, uh, so one to two is a golden ratio that we start with, right? Mm -hmm. And then you said that somewhere near one to three would be a lungo, right? A lungo, uh, yeah. So yeah. where does the lungo start? Like, if I go one to 2.5? Oh, good question. Yeah. Good question. Honestly, there's no, there's no definitive line that you cross. What I would say, my advice, and I've drunk a lot, a lot of espresso in my time, and I've drunk a lot of really amazing ones, and I've drunk far more really bad ones, uh, especially as a trainer. I have to taste a lot of coffee. Um, so what I would say is that you work with a, aim for an approximate one to two ratio, and build your recipe back from there. So don't worry too much, start with you know, 18 grams in, 36 out, or 20 grams in, 40 grams out, whatever, 16 in, 32 out. Start with that, and then taste it. Taste it and see how it tastes, because we can manipulate what we call the variables, which will be the dose, the grind size, the yield, possibly we can uh, adjust temperature, pressure, there's lots of other things we can consider. But if we start with that one to two, we have a really good benchmark. So if I find that that coffee is a little bit maybe flat, it's a little bit bitter, and it's not as bright as I would like it, maybe there's not as much um, uh, acidity in that espresso as I would quite like, which I know should be in there because I'm expecting it in this coffee, then maybe I would just adjust that. I would tweak it a little bit more. If I want a bit more body, for example, then I might um, adjust my ratio again. So we can just, we can manipulate it. That's one of the kind of joys of espresso is that like we can play around with it so much. And it does get to a point sometimes where you play around with it so much that you virtually end up where you were and you're like, well, that's a surprise. <laughs> but it's really good to be able to kind of move through it. So how far off are we, everybody, having a shot? Who doesn't have two coffees in front of them yet? Okay, oh, that's an interesting mix of, like, not one area that doesn't have them, just random people, okay. So, yes. Yeah, so just make sure you've got those cups in front of you and you've got a one and a two, and if you're missing, please just make sure people know, or not if you're missing, if it's missing, make sure people know. Um, what I'm going to actually do while we do this tasting, because I'm also conscious of time, um, and this obviously takes a while, is I'm going to just talk you through. I don't want to guide your tasting. I don't want to tell you what you're going to taste, okay? That's critical. It's not for me to tell you what your sensory experience is. But I'm going to just give you a bit of insight into what you might find. So, correct me if I'm wrong here, John. Uh, you have two shots. One is what we would typically refer to as under-extracted. Has anybody heard the term under-extracted? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, when a coffee is under-extracted, it basically means, from an extraction science perspective, we have not extracted enough from it, okay? We haven't taken enough compounds out. And that can be for many different reasons. 
Okay, there's lots of reasons we can under-extract a coffee. Then we have, hopefully, in the middle somewhere, we have a lovely balanced coffee. We have a lovely balanced espresso. But then we can go the other way, and we can be over-extracted. And when we are over-extracted, it means that our extraction, it was too long, it was too much. We essentially took too much out of that espresso puck, okay? So I want to kind of give you a bit of insight into why that might happen. So when we talk about extraction, I'm using this word loads. Under-extracted, over-extracted, good extraction, extraction with a machine, extraction with a grinder. But what we're talking about when we are extracting coffee is we are taking the, these flavor compounds and other elements um, from our solid form into a liquid, okay? So we have this kind of transfer and we're moving from essentially from solid to liquid, okay? Now, there is a level of extraction that we can get from a roasted coffee bean, and I'm going to go into that a bit more on the next slide, okay? So there's a, a level to our extraction, essentially, as in there is a possibility that like, we can reach a point where we can't get any more from it, and I'll, I'll tell you why on the next slide. Um, but through experiment, we know that roughly the maximum amount of um, roasted um, coffee that can be dissolved into water will be somewhere between sort of 24 to 35%, depending on a few different factors. And when we control this extraction process, we can control the flavor and we can control the body, okay? So that's what's critical. Don't worry about any of the science in the background. It's good to know, it's good to understand, but what we need to be aware of is that we can manipulate it, we can control it, okay? So, when we first start our extraction, I'm going to simplify this. It is not quite this straightforward, but just for ease. I want you to think that this first section is the first 10 seconds of our shot, okay? The second stage is the middle section. So let's say we've got a 30 second extraction that we're aiming for. This is our kind of zero to 10, roughly. It's not gonna be an exact science, but just for the purpose of this. Zero to 10, then we've got our kind of 10 to 20 second window, and then we've got after that, okay? So if I were to split my shot, um, into three parts, a 30 second espresso, and I did took the first 10 seconds, the second 10 seconds, and the third, that's what I would anticipate, okay? In this first stage of extraction, the coffee is going to be really concentrated, it's going to be really high in body, okay? It's got a really super, super, super high acidity. Like if you taste the first 10 seconds of a shot, mm, Oh, <laughs> like I love acidity in coffee, but that is going to probably turn my face inside out because it's so sour, okay? It's so concentrate. We have a really concentrated mouthfeel, so it's really intense and syrupy and thick. Weirdly, this is strange, but this is uh, sensory science at its best, the complexity of the coffee and the organic acids that are being extracted are lost. Because it's so concentrated, we can't perceive them. So you can taste it, but we as humans just go, oh, that's sour. We don't get the complexity of it, okay? Because uh, it's too intense for us to perceive anything. It has this really high viscosity. It will be usually very dark in color, and it will give you very misleading taste notes because even a very bitter coffee, a coffee that has been dark roasted, maybe a coffee that is perhaps 100% robusta, will still have this sharpness in the first part, okay? Where are we at with everybody? Fantastic. The second stage is where we get the good stuff, okay? So we get the good flavor profile of the coffee, but we don't get so much body. We get a drop in mouthfeel. It's less concentrate because there's more liquid. We get a reduced viscosity. We get increased nuances. So we're like, oh, now I'm tasting some nice things in this. We get less acids extracted at this point. We get an increased perception of acidity, though. Less acids coming out, but increased perception. And that's because now, as a human, it's coming to a range that I can actually perceive. Okay? I'm able to perceive it a bit more at this point. And it's typically lighter in color. 
So by our third stage, it's astringent. And astringency, by definition, means the, the, oops, sorry, the binding of our salivary glands. Okay, so it means it physically, it's not just the drying of our mouth, it's the binding of our salivary glands. So it really dries us out, okay? So if something's astringent, it's pretty intense. It lacks positive attributes. It's thin, it's watery, uh, it has a low body, it's pale. The coffee bed is exhausted. It's like, guys, give it up. Like, you're not getting anything more out of me. I've given you everything I've got. So if we take these stages individually, they're not so great, right? The middle one, doable, but it's a bit thin, perhaps. What happens is this magic when we put all of them together, because then we get the right volume, then we get the right acidity, then we get the sweetness and the fruit notes and those, those compounds that we can start to detect. We are able to really identify a lot more complexity when we pull this shot together. So what we're giving you now is actually two extremes. We're not giving you the balance bit, you've got to wait for that. Uh, we're giving you an under-extracted coffee and an over-extracted coffee. So I'd like you all to start having a taste. So have a sip. And remember, this is not a test. There is no pass or fail. This is just for fun. If you notice a difference, fabulous. If you don't, don't worry about it. Get tasting more espresso. Are there any spare? Don't worry if not, I just, I was going to taste one. <laughs> okay, so what I want to think about with uh, number one, what's the body like? Is it thin? A bit watery? A bit lacking? Okay. Anything else you notice with number one? Sorry? Crema's is bad, yeah. Some of them will also have been sitting for a little while, so. But yeah, crema won't be very good. Is anybody noticing a real kind of sharpness, not very balanced? So. Uh, yeah, yeah, between one and two, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with our first shot, shot one, we have out, I'm doing this by memory because I'm not tasting it, but uh, one was our under-extracted shot, okay? So what happened here, the way we created this under-extracted shot was to basically create uh, an espresso. We set it all up at the right points, but we made the grind size really coarse, okay? So what that means is the bits of coffee are really big. So when we start the extraction, when we press the button on the espresso machine, the water runs through really quickly, okay? And because it run, runs through quickly, it's under-extracting. It's not pulling everything out. Now, organic acids, thanks, my favorite. <laughs> uh, the organic acids, thank you. I am going to actually taste alongside you. Um, the acids are very soluble. So we get the, uh, the acidity, even in a thin, watery, like under-extracted course shot, because the organic acids um, get into the cup really easily. What we don't get is some of the other compounds that balance that coffee more. So we just get this kind of sharpness, and it's thin, and it's watery, and it just isn't very pleasant overall. And then what about number two? So number two is our over-extracted shot, okay? So what we did with this was, again, we kept all the other variables the same. The difference is we adjusted the grind size much finer. So this has slowed the shot down, okay? So we've gone from like a 15 second extraction on this one to like 40 seconds on this one, okay? So we've really slowed it down. So do you notice the difference in the body with the second one? Yeah, it's not as thin, is it? It's not as watery. And what about, what about bitterness? Increased bitterness, absolutely. So if I have either of these, Hang on, I'm going to actually have one. I mean, the difficulty with this coffee, I'm not going to lie, is it is a really good coffee, and even when we really badly extract it, it still doesn't taste horrendous. <laughs> but yeah, the first one, it's really thin, it's bright, it's a bit sharp, it's not balanced. I've not got a balance, which is what I'm looking for in my espresso. And the second one, the body's much better, the crema's better, but it's bitter. Okay, that worked well. It's always a little bit nerve-wracking, and just in case it tastes good and doesn't taste as bad as you hoped. Here, hey. Uh. <laughs> so, 
So uh, at the end of uh, while you were explaining at the third stage. Sorry, can you just shout a little bit louder at me? <laughs> while you were explaining on the third stage, you said that if we if they all combine it together, they form a balanced mm -hmm. thing, right? So what if we do it here? Will it work? You're going to try that in a minute. So what we what we've not done. So sorry, I didn't mean to cause any confusion. We haven't split the shots for you. I considered it because that would be a way that I would do it if we were running a class and there was maybe six of you. We would pull six espresso shots and I'd give you all three shots. But because of the size of the group, we couldn't do it. We had to split the shots. So an interesting thing for you to try yourself is to dial in, get a really good espresso balanced, and then split the shot. Three cups and you just do first part, second part, third part. If you can put them into small glasses and look visually, you'll be amazed at the difference in color. Swirl them around the glass, you'll see the difference in the viscosity, the way it moves. Uh, and look at the difference in body. And then taste them. And then you'll notice the difference. And you'll literally feel these three parts. It's absolutely incredible. You can also do the same with a filter coffee, by the way. And when I say filter coffee, I don't mean with milk, uh, but if you're having a batch brew, if you're brewing a V60 or a Chemex, you can do the same and you get a similar result. Obviously, the volume is different, but break it down into three stages. It's, it's crazy and it's a really good insight because what it means is that we can start to identify that like actually, I think this is under extracted or over extracted because of these elements I'm tasting. So just to give you, I've kind of mentioned this, but just to really recap on the extraction. This gets a bit complicated, so if you don't follow this, I don't blame you, um, but I'm going to go there for those of you that might, might be with us on it. So, I want you to imagine, I mean, it's not hard to imagine, this is li I've never had a life-size coffee bean before. This is pretty incredible. I must get a photograph of this later. <laughs> so, this is uh, our coffee bean, okay, our roasted bean. Let's say it's a medium roast, nice specialty coffee. I want you to imagine this is 100%, okay? Roughly, and it is give or take, but roughly we know that somewhere between 24 to 35% of this bean is available to extract, okay? The rest of it is insoluble compounds. So I'm talking about cellulose. I'm talking about plant fiber. I'm talking about the stuff that's left in the coffee bed in the puck. You can't, it's not soluble. It doesn't matter how hard you try, how fine you grind, how hot you go you know, with your water temperature, it's not getting in the cup, hopefully. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to extract it. Okay, we don't want to drink that bit. That's, the, that's what's left. But around 24 to 35% of it is available of ex uh, to extract. However, Extracting 35% of it doesn't necessarily mean we get a great tasting espresso, okay? Because we could take too much from it. So science leads us, and there are exceptions to this, of course, and people are always pushing boundaries, and we will see different extractions, and that's great. But within most dynamics, for most coffees, for most coffee shops, most setups, if we aim for around 18 to 22% of that 100%, in the cup, it's usually pretty good, okay? Now that's complicated, and how on earth do I know whether I've extracted 18% or 23%? We can use a tool, which John has on the table here, that is known, I'll show you it in just one second, that is known as a refractometer, okay? And this is, this is getting very fancy, so don't panic, but this is a way of us measuring how much the TDS, okay, the TDS of our coffee essentially, which is the strength, and then we can do a calculation to work out our extraction percentage. So when I'm giving you these extractions or these percentages, there is some science behind it and we can measure it. But this isn't the stuff we're doing on a daily basis, certainly not if we're a home brewer most of the time, and definitely not in most cafes, okay? It's just for you to understand that there is science behind this. I'm not just giving you my opinion. We've tested and studied it, okay? Now, when we talk about extraction, we are effectively referring to the percentage, or when we talk about extraction percentage, the percentage of soluble compounds, stuff that can be dissolved, um, that we have removed from the coffee bed, okay? So, to give you an idea, an under-extracted coffee, 
it's going to be, that was around about 13%. And you could taste it. I'm like, I don't need a refractometer to tell me that's under-extracted, right? And our over-extracted, 23 24%, okay? Just to give you a rough idea. Because the over-extracted was over. It wasn't horrendous. I've tasted much worse, much more over-extracted. But just to give you an idea of the range. So what John's doing now is he's tweaking the grind size to get an optimum extraction, to get a balanced espresso, okay? And what that means is he's actually using the refractometer to make sure he does it properly as well. Um, but he'll give you an espresso that is balanced and that sits within that 18 to 22% range, okay? It does not mean it's going to be your favorite espresso because there's still so much preference in this. But it means we've used a bit of science to make sure everything's working properly and we've, we've got it just roughly where we need it. And then we can just tweak it to taste. So the other thing we have to consider is strength. And by strength, I'm talking about the body, okay? I'm talking about the mouthfeel. So forget about coffee for a second. Let's imagine I have uh, some freshly squeezed orange juice, okay? I have a freshly squeezed jug of orange juice, and I have three glasses. And in my first glass, I'm just going to pour um, one third of the glass is fresh orange juice, and I'm going to top it up with two thirds water. In my second glass, I'm going to have two-thirds, um, two I forgot I'd given it to you in thirds or quarters then, two-thirds of the glass is going to be fresh orange juice, concentrate, one-third water. And in my third glass, I'm just going to have pure, freshly squeezed orange juice. The strength of those is different, okay, because I've diluted them. I've diluted it with water. So that changes the body, it changes the mouthfeel, the fresh orange juice is less intense, some people say they can actually perceive a little bit more from it because it's not so concentrate, it's not so sharp. So it's the same with coffee. The amount of water we put in versus the amount of coffee we use, okay? And these rules apply with different per percentages, but the same strength rules apply with filter coffee as well. So in an espresso, not a filter coffee, but in an espresso, we're going to have around 89 to 91% water in the cup. Then we're going to have a dilution of coffee solids in an espresso of around 9 to 11%, okay? So this is not filter coffee, this is espresso. Strength, when we talk about it from a technical term, is the dilution of dissolved coffee solids in the finished brew. And the, the, to cut a very scientific long story short, it's responsible for the body. So if your coffee is thin and watery, it's too weak. Okay? So we need to think about this dilution of the compounds, the dilution of the solids. Now, this is what we use a refractometer for. We use a refractometer to take a measure that tells us the TDS, and the TDS is the total dissolved solids, okay? So I know the strength, and then I can calculate extraction percentage. It is complicated, it is complex, and it is probably way off where most of you would want to be brewing most of your daily coffees, but it gives you an idea about what's happening scientifically behind it, okay? So, oh. Oh no, I was using the light. Now I know what that button is. <laughs> and I haven't been using it. There we go, I could have been pointing. Oh. <laughs> okay, so, the solubility of our coffee, so its ability essentially to be dissolved using a solute, our water, um, will vary depending on lots of different factors, okay? And of course, we don't have time to go into all of these, but you need to consider them, okay? There will be things like processing method. How has it been processed? Is it a washed? Is it a honey? Is it a natural? Is it a 200-hour anoxic fermentation? Like, how has it been processed? It will have an impact on its solubility, okay? Roast profile. Roast profile will make a massive impact on its solubility. The more you roast, the darker the roast, the more soluble, the more easily uh, we, can, we can grab things out, essentially. We need to be very mindful of roast profile. Sometimes we have to work a little bit harder to um, draw the correct extraction from a lighter roasted coffee. So if anybody's ever had a coffee that is... 
uh, maybe more of a, what we call like a Scandinavian style roast because they really favor a light roast for their specialty coffees. You really have to work hard to extract from it. Coffee freshness, how fresh or, or not your coffee is. Uh, because coffee oxidi roasted coffee oxidizes very quickly and we need to store it well, otherwise it's not going to be very fresh. Temperature, water quality and grind size. So all of these things, this is what I mean, there's a lot of variables. It's not just your grinder, it's not just your espresso machine. All of these things will have an impact. So, what are we extracting? Look at that beauty. <laughs> so this, to put it into perspective, is a very zoomed in, <laughs> microscopic view of the inside of a roasted, not green, roasted coffee bean, okay? Now, this is what you're seeing here, it's a pretty cool picture I always think, is the cellular matrix of a coffee bean, okay? And it forms the biggest part of a coffee bean's mass, okay? So this is like what makes the bean a bean, essentially. It's its structure, it's what holds it together. Now this matrix is composed of fibers, lipids, organic acids, there's carbohydrates, and lots of other chemical compounds, okay? Caffeine, chlorogenic acids, etc. Inside these pores, so when we roast this coffee, inside these pores, what happens, there's hundreds of what we call VOCs, which stands for volatile organic compounds that get trapped inside here, okay? I can use the pointer, can't I? This is extra fancy. So they get trapped in here, okay? So this is why when we grind coffee, boom, we suddenly get this explosion of aromatics because we release these volatile aromatic compounds that have been sitting, waiting to be released when we grind it, okay? And this is also why, because they're not completely stable, so if we age a coffee, as a coffee ages, they dissipate. And if we grind a coffee and we leave it sitting there for ages and we walk away from it and an hour later we come back to brew it, a lot of the flavor has gone because those volatile organic compounds and those aromatic compounds were like, see you later, I've been trapped in that bean for ages, I'm off, okay? Yeah, this can, this can be the big difference between having a doser grinder, so the ones with the paddles, that you actually then get the coffee out from there, and then having the automatics like we're using today. So a lot of doser grinders store the coffee in the chamber and it ages. And it's pre-ground, so you turn it on, it grinds it, it leaves it sitting in there, all those really delicious compounds disappear. And what you need to care about with this, what you really need to be mindful of, is that flavor, okay, is not taste, it's not what we taste on our tongue, it's not just that. We can pick up basic taste with that, but flavor is all about the aromatics, okay? It's to do with what we perceive through our sense of smell. So if we pre-grind a coffee or we have an aged coffee and, or a stale coffee, they've gone. So it's never gonna taste good. It doesn't matter what you do with the grinder because a lot of that has gone. It's dissipated already, okay? So we need to be really mindful of that because flavor is created through the combination of all of these aromatic compounds that we smell through our noses and also through the backs of our mouths when we swallow and our basic taste. So this is why it is key and this is why we're so fussy about grinding fresh to order. Okay, so we're moving into our last section here which is hopefully pretty good on timing. And we're also, thank you, <laughs> we're doing a very good job here uh, putting together a balanced espresso for you. So we're just gonna run through, while those shots are being prepared, we're going to just quickly run through some troubleshooting. This is common extraction issues that we come across. It is not um, a finite list, okay? It's not like we have not managed to grab hold of everything, every issue we come across. These are some of the most common that we would find, okay? Yeah, so the first one we see on here is uneven extraction. If anything, every coffee you ever brew is gonna be uneven. There are millions of extractions happening at one time and the water is never gonna pass through it evenly. If you ever see the path of water, it's almost just dipping, going in and out, and it's eroding the coffee bed. So, unfortunately, we could never really get a perfect 
even district like extraction, but we will try. And the best things for us to achieve that is first, we have to consider the dose that we're using. So based on Darcy's law, if you have a bigger bed, it's gonna take longer for that water to pass through it. So if the bed is bigger, it's gonna take longer, which means you might extract less. So it can actually be beneficial, rather than upping your dose, to actually bringing the dose down and extracting more from a smaller dose. It's also very good to consider the basket size that you're using. A lot of the manufacturers will tell you, if they're good, what size basket it can hold. So if you put too much coffee in, the water is not gonna pass through it. It's gonna build up puck pressure and you're gonna end up with more than likely an over-extracted shot. And the opposite can happen when there's too much room, too much headspace between where the water comes out and the coffee is, which leads to more of that under extraction. It can work both ways as well. So also you have grind size. Yet again, the finer the grind size, the better we can extract. But you need both grind size for you to be able to get an extraction as well. So they bind together as the water pushes through. There isn't really much knowledge on my, uh, fines migration. So a lot of people talk about the, it clogging the bottom of the coffee bed. But yet again, this is something that's still new and needs a bit more time to study. This is just leaning into what we call particle distribution size, which we're not like massively delving into because there's a whole hour and a half's worth of conversation just on that one subject. But just be mindful that when we use a grinder, we don't create one exact grind size. You'll know from your capsule extractions, I'm sure, that actually we need um, multiple different grind sizes to, to get the best extraction. Uh, but just be aware that you don't just get like one uniform um, grind size when we grind. That's just, just what that is in reference to. And yield, we already went over when we were talking about the ratios. With distribution and tamping, distribution really is the key to all of this. So, and this can be done manually with your hand. You don't need to be spending loads of money buying distribution tools. A lot of it can be done just by tapping the handle on the fork of the grinder and making that bed nice and level before we tamp it. It's much more important that you have that bed level before you tamp it to get a much more hopeful, even extraction. Ergonomics, so you can buy as well to make things a little bit easier and faster for you in terms of workflow, automatic tampers, which can speed things up and also gives you the consistency of having the same amount of pressure for each of your tamps. Now, it's not the most important thing, your tamping pressure, because the machine will produce much more pressure than you will ever, ever be capable of pushing with your arm, even if you're Hercules. It's not gonna happen. The machine is where the pressure comes from. So all we're doing with tamping is we're alleviating a lot of the airspace between the grinds. So we're tamping and it hasn't got to be super hard. Okay, so water quality. I'm actually gonna cover this on the next slide briefly. Let me tell you, water makes up a massive part of your espresso and your filter coffee. So paying attention to water is critical, okay? Again, a bit like particle distribution size, but we need to be mindful that this is a really big topic. We're leaning into it, we're giving you some very brief tips on it today, but water is critical. And if you are installing an espresso machine in a cafe or you already have one in a cafe, make sure that you are working, you know, when you have that machine installed, speak to an engineer or speak to a supplier that understands your water supply in your area. What filtration system will you need for that machine? And you will need one. Um, what are you looking at from a mineral content perspective, etc.? But I'm going to just give you a brief overview on the next slide. And then coffee freshness, I've told you about this already, but flavour is lost over time, okay? So post-roast. But also, when coffee is exposed to heat, if it is exposed to oxygen, and if it is exposed to moisture. So keep your roasted coffee in a sealed bag. If it comes in a lovely bag that you can reseal, great. If it doesn't, take it out of the grinder at the end of service, put it back in the bag, do the bag up. Store it in an airtight container. 
just whatever you do, protect that coffee. See those roasted coffee beans as, you know, as soon as they're, even when they're in the grinder hopper, where they sit while they're waiting to be ground, they are still aging, okay? There's not an airtight space. So overnight, keep them away from bright lights, be mindful of things like humidity, and you'll really increase the quality of your coffee and, and the longevity of it. Right, so a very quick focus on water. This is the SCA Water Guides. If you go to a world competition, if you um, go and visit a roaster in Australia, if you go and visit a roaster in South Korea, and they are following the SCA principles, they'll be working to this. It doesn't matter where in the world you go, okay? So this is really critical. It may not mean a lot to you, which is why I'm saying to you, speak to somebody that understands water when you invest in your espresso equipment. Find out about filtration, speak to your local supplier, and they can guide you. And all of these things with reference, like with numbers, we can test, okay? So, our water must be odour-free and hygienic. It must be safe to drink, of course, free of chlorine and any other taste-influencing substances. It must be fresh and clean. We don't want old water, okay? It must have, or it should have, a total hardness of between 50 and 175 parts per million. What does that even mean? It's the mineral content. What minerals, how many minerals do we have in our coffee? What minerals matter, but also how many do we have? We want an alkalinity of 40 to 75 parts per million, which again, when you have a water filter installed, they'll be able to advise you on. We want a neutral pH, low sodium, we want it iron free, and I'll mention it again because it's so important, chlorine free. Okay, so the final thing that we're going to consider while you're getting your espressos handed out is coffee quality, okay? So a major factor for a great espresso is, of course, the coffee. You need to consider, is your coffee specialty or non-specialty? I am sorry, but I, I do not fall into the camp that if you are not paying loads of money for your coffee and you're buying the most expensive coffee there is, it's not going to taste good. That's rubbish. Because you can buy a really expensive coffee and you can make it taste really bad. Okay, so work with the coffee you have. It's more important to understand where it's come from, who grew it, how was it produced, has the farmer been paid well, etc. Okay, buy the coffee you can afford, buy the coffee you can access. If you are fortunate enough to be able to get really great coffee, uh, specialty grade coffee, which is a coffee that scores 80 points or more on the SCA um, grading score when we cup it. If you are fortunate enough to have access to that, fantastic. Um, and the quality of your coffee will, of course, be exceptional. If you have a non-specialty coffee, you can still make it taste really good. And you can still make it taste balanced, okay? Consider the process. Again, I mentioned this earlier. Wash, natural, honey, anaerobic, infused. I had a submarine fermentation from a lovely uh, Indian uh, producer, which was incredible. Uh, think about the roast level. Remember, that affects the solubility of the coffee. And, of course, the actual quality of the green coffee. And I'm not talking about specialty or not. I'm talking about the physical quality. Is it free of defects? You know, there's not so much insect damage. We don't have to worry about the fact that it maybe is phenolic or it maybe has mold in it. You know, the original green quality will, of course, really count. Okay, so I think, hopefully... We're just about getting to a point where you can taste a balanced espresso. Just give me one second. We have, I have one slide on optimum extraction, but it's everything we covered. So I'm going to just, I will answer your question, but I'm just going to put it on the board while you taste, okay? Um, so what I'll say here, just to summarize, because I don't want to go too far over time. Uh, can I say that we started a few minutes late, and that's why I'm running a few minutes later. Uh, but you need to ultimately remember, when you're creating your coffee, when you're creating your espresso, compounds dissolve at different rates, different compounds at different rates. Remember, organic acids, way, yeah, straight in the cup. We love it. Okay, but lipids and, you know, some of the other elements that will come into the cup will um, extract at different times, which is why you get those different um, prominent flavor notes. Around 24 to 35% of a roasted coffee could be extracted. It's not a goal. <laughs> it's not what we're necessarily aiming for. We know that typically the optimum balance of flavor will come from taking around 18 to 22% of that uh, coffee bean, okay? 
Strength refers to the concentration of solubles. Think about the orange juice. Is it pure, concentrated, freshly squeezed orange, or have I diluted it down, and if so, by how much? The percentage of coffee flavoring material amount to water will determine the body. Is it thin? Do I need to put a bit more water? You know, how do I want it to, to be with a mouthfeel? It really impacts the mouthfeel on the body. And extraction is referring to, in technical terms, the soluble's yield. It is the amount of coffee material that you have removed from the grounds during that extraction, okay? And it determines the flavor. So in a nutshell, if you taste an espresso and it tastes bad, then you probably have extracted not enough or too much. If you taste an espresso and it tastes good, but it's a bit thin, then you need to think about the strength and the body and the mouthfeel. Because when we taste our optimum coffee, which I'm really hoping this is, should be, if all our tests went well, of course it will be, Sachindra, I'm not implying it won't be. <laughs> but what we're aiming for here is unlike our really thin, um, acidic espresso or our, you know, very syrupy but very bitter espresso, we're now going to get this balance. We're now going to get this optimum extraction where we can pick up some sweet notes in that uh, aromatic. We can get a really lovely acidity, but it's not sharp, it's not unbalanced. We're going to get a great body and a nice mouthfeel. Okay, and it's going to be coating and it's going to have a lovely texture. It's going to be a really good base for me to steam a milk and pour some milk into to turn it into an espresso-based drink or a super delicious espresso all on its own. So what we're aiming for is this combination of everything coming together nicely. And if it's not quite right for you and it's still a little bit too acidic or maybe you want it to be, um, you know, have a little bit more body to it, you can play around with those variables to get it to suit exactly what you want, okay? Right, I'm going to stop there. We had one uh, slide. I'm very mindful of timing. We are going into lunch now, so if anybody wants to ask any questions, we're happy to, because uh, there's not another session for a little while. But I was just going to say we had one slide, sorry, on cafe considerations, which we've I'll just very quickly run through. We've pretty much covered, okay? But I'm going to just put it up on the board. We've spoken to you about all of these things already. But just to kind of summarize, for those of you that are from a cafe background or going into that, these are your considerations, okay? So really give, give this some thought. And questions? Can you share additional information regarding misleading notes? You, you specified Sorry. in uh, misleading notes. Uh, you specified in one slide misleading ah, notes. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, can so you share additional information? I can regarding explain the it same? in more detail. That is a very good question. How can we evaluate, the, assess the uh, misleading note? So you are referring to. Hang on. I know exactly what slide yeah. that is, because it's very confusing. Yeah, here. Here. Phase one. Misleading taste Misleading notes. Taste yeah, notes. yeah. So what that means is, regardless of the roast profile, the coffee quality, the process, what what coffee I actually have, the species, even if that coffee were a coffee that typically would have quite high bitterness or quite low acidity. As a full espresso, okay, so I would expect this coffee to be lower in acidity. Let's think, really lovely example, uh, a 100% Arabica versus a 100% Robusta. The acidity levels, the bitterness levels are very different, okay? They suit different markets or they work beautifully blended together or as standalone options, okay? But they have very different flavor profiles. Both equally can be very delicious, but very different flavor profiles. So what we need to think about is... With our stages of espresso or stages of extraction, even with a 100% robusta, if I take the first part of that shot, I have extracted its organic acids. So if I were to just pull a short shot and taste that first bit, even with a 100% robusta that's maybe had quite a, an intense development on the roast, it will still have this sourness because it's organic acids only at that point. Not only, but, you know, prominent in the cup. So what that means is it's misleading because I might think, oh, oh this coffee, this isn't my 100% Robusta that has had a good development for this espresso roast because it's really sour. No, it's not. It's because you've only taken a bit of the extraction, okay? You need to take the rest of it. Does that make sense? So it just means you can't take 
if you, if you split the shot or if you just considered that very first part, it would not give you the true reflection of that coffee's flavour profile. That's what I meant by that. But good question. Thank you. Yeah? Um, my question is, obviously, you've also consulted in cafes. You're still consulting in cafes. One of the key um, sort of issues in hospitality is staff retention <laughs> and the fact that when you train your staff, they leave. Yeah. Right? That's very common. Yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, I will not get into deep into th about that, but how are you creating SOPs for the new baristas to come in um, and sort of take shape with uh, your coffee program so that you don't you lose your regular customers? Because people get fixated on their coffee and then they always want it a specific way. So how do you set SOPs in motion for some kind of standardization? So firstly, incredible question. And SOPs should be in place everywhere for everything, okay? And I think so, for those that may not know what it is, an SOP is a standard operating procedure. And as ridiculous as this sounds, you can have an SOP for how you want the floor, the bathroom floor of the toilets cleaned, okay? And what we have to think about when we employ staff is that it is not our staff's duty to create SOPs. It is our duty as the business owner or perhaps the business manager to initiate how we want this business to run. Okay, so if we want our business to have a certain look and feel about it and a certain customer experience, which is critical, it's the difference, you know, why do you go to one cafe over another? Many reasons, probably, hopefully, because they serve great coffee and maybe great food or whatever, but also because the staff experience is great, because everything else is really good. So when we talk about SOPs, okay, it's our job to implement these and then we train our staff to instill them. We train our staff to do this every day and to keep going with it and to keep repeating these. So that what happens is, because this is the same issue we have, if a cafe owner has a really successful cafe and they say, great, now I want to expand. Well, how do you expand? Because you only have this really great group of staff. You can't replicate them. Well, you're going to replicate them through procedures. So with regards to staff retention, it's a massive question and honestly, it's a global issue. Um, I think we look at, you know, fair pay, fair treatment, uh, treating our staff as well as possible. The biggest issue I would say as a business owner is if you decided not to train your staff. You must train, you will train staff that will leave you and go somewhere else, and that is a natural progression. And we need to start looking at that as some of our leading specialty cafes in the UK have, you'll see barista, world barista champions and barista competitors all over the world who all started from like these small cafe environments and very often they all have very similar backgrounds or work together and they've grown up and they've grown out of that and they've moved maybe into a different role and they, it's career progression. So I think if we're churning over staff very quickly, then maybe there's internal issues we need to look at or how can we make this role more inviting? And of course, it will be very specific to where you are and you know, within India, it will be different to the UK. But we need to look at how we can create an environment where people can grow within the business and we can train those staff to be the best they can. So they come in every day and they feel a real sense of pride in what they do. They're serving great coffee on really good equipment. And if it's not really expensive equipment, it doesn't matter. It's equipment that's loved and cared for and looked after and cleaned. And everybody has a real sense of pride in their job. And understand that we want our staff to grow. Because that's how we create a really incredible business dynamic that then enables us to grow as a business. So sorry, that was a very big answer yeah, to I was, that. I was also just going to add question. that you have a lasting impression as well on your staff. So yeah. the staff that leave, they talk to people. So you want to, even if they're leaving, they're going to be telling their friends if it was a positive or negative experience. And if they leave for other things, they are going to tell them, oh, do you know what? That coffee shop, amazing. You should go work there. But if they leave for the reasons of, you know, workflow, pay, etc., like values, then they're gonna, you're going to have a negative impact. So you should be looking at the staff that come in and, you know, people move on. It's, yeah. not, it's not like a bad thing necessarily, but you want them to be saying good things about your business when they do move on. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? So you spoke about uh, 
how the burrs of the grinder get hot by the evening, right? Yes. And, uh, and that would impact the extraction in the morning versus the evening. So what the takeaway from that really is that you need to keep dialing in and basically keep checking the, uh, the adjusting the grind size throughout the day. Is that what you're trying you, to do? You have two options. So you can also, if you're lucky enough to have a machine that you can change the temperature on, so you can change the group head temperature as the day so goes to, you know, a essentially It'll alleviate some of those issues. But if you haven't got that, you are constantly dialing in throughout the day. Mm. Yeah. And it, there will be fluctuations and small variations are fine. Like we're talking about the difference between, you know, having your, like every shot will, be, will fluctuate. There'll be some level oh, of yeah, fluctuation. Oh yeah, over in there, it. like I'm yeah. witnessing it. I'm seeing as the grinder's getting hotter, the shots are running faster, and then yeah. I'm having to tweak it each time. So it's it, it's, it's normal it's for that ongoing. to happen, but you just need to be aware of it and maybe just check that extraction. I'm just going to quickly check. I think there's nobody coming in straight after this, so we're okay with some questions. Yeah. Is that oh no. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. okay, great. We'll have a couple more questions. And if you have your um, extra shot on the table, hopefully you've all already drank it, but that is just for you to enjoy. And hopefully, thank you, uh, well, John and Sajindra for providing great espressos. You'll see the difference with a, a balanced espresso. Yeah. yeah? So I, uh, you'd mentioned earlier about the pre-infusion. Mm -hmm. So is there an ideal time for it, like one second or two seconds for it, or does it change with the with the coffee? Uh, one way, uh, a good way that I've found is to judge it on the first drip that comes out of the coffee. So to stop the pre-infusion at that point, and then you can program your machine to stop, but it will change again, depending on the grind size. So you can have a pre-infusion upwards of 10, 12 seconds with a lower, lower pressure, but it will depend on the machine you're using. There's uh, there's never, a, a, like we would say, it has to be eight There's seconds, it rule. has to be three seconds. Yeah, we would say do it by taste, do it by extraction, and you have to remember solubility of the espresso. Mm. Because if you change espresso, all of these pre-infusions will be different, you know, depending on many different uh, factors. But just be aware that like that pre-infusion or soft infusion is a way to prepare the coffee bed to be extracted fully. So it just is going to increase the extraction potential, which is why we see a lot of specialty coffee shops using it. Oh, sorry, okay. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, suppose I've roasted the coffee today. Yeah. Can I extract tomorrow? Um, you can, but I would wish you lots of luck. <laughs> um, in, so a, in a very be? brief nutshell, when we roast a coffee, uh, what happens is uh, the coffee starts to give off CO2. Yeah. So this is a stage that roasters refer to as degassing. What we find, and again, this will vary coffee by coffee, roaster by roaster, profile by profile, but what we typically find is that actually espresso roast likes to be rested. And usually that's for around a minimum of, say, seven days, yeah. sometimes even a bit longer. Okay. So one of the issues we face, actually, is, believe it or not, it can be coffee that's too fresh. And what will signify you have a very fresh coffee is you'll start the extraction and you'll see actual bubbles in that stream of espresso. Okay. And that is the CO2 desperately trying to escape. If you are forced to use a coffee that is very fresh, and we, we have it because sometimes deliveries come in and we run out of coffee quicker than we thought and ah, we're gonna have to use the fresh stuff. You can counteract it by doing things like, um, you can maybe, uh, well with grind you can counteract, you can, I mean, you could leave it in the hopper for yeah, a while this, to let it degas, open it. the bag. Do the opposite to everything we would do for the <laughs> coffee freshness, with the exception of like pre-grinding, because you'll still lose those vol um, volatile ar aromatics. But yeah, there's ways to counteract it. But in an ideal world, if you can, let it rest. And the, the, the espresso will be a hundred times better. And actually, it's something really fun to explore. As a roaster, if you've got the opportunity to, try it. You know, do a roast, and out of that roast, 
maybe save one kilo that you are going to try the very next day, have another kilo of the same roast that you try in seven days, and another kilo that you try in 10 or 12 days, and you'll see the difference. And it's a really good um, a bit of guidance you can give to your customers. Like, hey, our coffee's really fresh, let it rest, and then it will, it will so be even better. The optimum time you suggest is at least five days? I would usually, again, there's many different factors that come into play because roast profile, et cetera, but, and storage conditions. But I would say minimum five, more like t uh, seven days. Some people will even say 10. Uh, I mean, some roasters even say 14, but it's very much because they've done testing themselves um, and that's their preference. Um, there is actually a roaster who's running, he's doing the sample roasting course, he's called Matthew Orchard, he's an incredible roaster from the UK. He runs a company called Plot, and they're based in London. Oh, I'm a big fan, as you can tell, great, great coffees, um, and a, just a very knowledgeable roaster. And he actually says on a lot of his coffees, you know, basically rest me, please rest me, because then you'll get the optimum from me. And there is a difference between a light and a... Yeah. Yeah, because the rate of degassing changes mm -hmm. depending on the roast development. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I know, it's a I deep a rabbit hole. Uh, so with the lighter Last roasts, uh, so I yeah. is it good to uh, increase the dosage or is it uh, good to increase the grind size? I mean, go finer to get I a better shot. Usually, you c there's many variables you can adjust. My advice to you would be grind size is usually the easiest. Go for the grind size first because it's usually the easier one to adjust. But whatever variable you decide to adjust, do one at a time. Right, Don't yeah. think like, oh, I'm going to adjust the grind size. I'm going to increase the temperature because I have a fancy machine that I can. I'm going to maybe adjust the pressure because I can. Uh, and I'm going to adjust the dose. Because if you fix it, you're not going to know what fixed it. And if you get even further away from it, you don't know which variables to tweak. So whatever you do, just take one, it looks like a lot, it's really overwhelming, but just take one that is low hanging fruit, like grind size, and say, can we tweak that? Yeah. And typically I would say with a light roast, you just have to work a bit harder to extract it. So maybe if you can go a little bit hotter sometimes, not too hot, but a little bit hotter with the temperature and you know, adjusting grind size usually does the trick. Or just you've, buy you've a slightly more developed roast. You've got to consider cost as well. So for a cafe, if you're just switching from 16 grams to 18 grams, mm -hmm. suddenly, if you look yeah. at how much you're spending on yeah. top of that at the end of the year, it's going to be much better consistently for you to know about, you know, your margins. So yeah, I mean, I if you're a roaster, you'd tell everyone to, oh, you've got to use at least 20 grams. <laughs> you'd want everyone using more. Right, we are definitely there for time now with questions. If there are more questions, we gave you at the very beginning, I'll try and skip back. Uh, we are on Instagram. We're also around at the show, so feel free to come and uh, grab us and ask any other questions or after this. Uh, but I'm just mindful that we probably need to evacuate the room now. But thank you all yeah, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed your coffees. Thank you very much, Emma and Jonathan. I really enjoyed the session as much as I enjoyed the coffee, I ho and I hope you also did too. So I would like to request Mr. Dr. Mandapa, uh, Divisional Head of Co Coffee Quality, Coffee Board of India, to give away the mementos to our presentees. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So before we all head out to lunch, our next session is about sipping sustainability. So we will see you sharp at two. And thank you very much. <laughs>